the book of Acts as we start a new series this morning. Um, the book of Acts, um, chapter 1, the first 11 verses. The word of the Lord reads, In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. <clears throat> He presented himself alive to them after his sufferings by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee... Why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Well, amen. Looking forward to our time as we start this new series through the book of Acts. It's a large book in the New Testament, and so we're looking forward to working our way through it over these next few weeks and more. Let's uh, pray together. Father, thank you for your word, and we pray now that you would instruct us by it. Give us wisdom and understanding, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we do live in a region where bridges serve important purposes. Whether it's the 301 bridge heading over the Potomac into Virginia, or the, I call it the Solomon's Bridge, I don't know what its real name is, over to Solomon's, or Calvert County, or the Bay Bridge in Annapolis, bridges are important because they connect people to places. They're really a vital part of our infrastructure as we think about moving people from place to place. They're really helpful to do that. We know how important bridges can be. Well, on one hand, the book of Acts is a type of bridge. It's a literary bridge or maybe even a historical bridge. It's a book that connects us from the life and ministry of Jesus to the establishment and expansion of the church as it's developed throughout the book. In fact, Acts, the book of Acts, is the only book in the New Testament that describes the foundational decades following the ministry of Christ when the church is founded and begins to grow and expand outward. The book of Acts really holds a unique place in the New Testament and all of Scripture. It contains almost 14% of the New Testament, and it recounts this new stage in Christian history. Think about, think about where we are. Everything that has come before the book of Acts and uh, everything that has led up to this moment has either been before Jesus or with Jesus. This is now the first time after Jesus has arrived and fulfilled the promise, he's now ascending back to heaven, that we have an account of what life for believers would look like after Jesus' ascension back into heaven. And that's exactly what we're going to see. It's a glimpse of this initial impact that Christ makes in the lives of his followers and in the church moving forward. The book of Acts is also known as a sequel to the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke. Uh, Acts is written by Luke, and so really the gospel of Luke is part one and the book of Acts is part two, and oftentimes you will find them referenced together of Luke-Acts, and so it's the same same author written uh, that that wrote uh, the gospel of Luke is, is writing the book of Acts, and really this book picks right up where Luke leaves off in his gospel. And so it's an important book because of that connection it makes from that historical pivotal time when Jesus ascends and now to the development of the church. 
It's a book that follows the mission of God as he gives it to his apostles and sends them out as witnesses to make known the truth of the gospel to a lost world. It's a mission that would start with this ragtag group of disciples in Jerusalem. These, this, this small band of disciples, it would start with them and then begin to make its way to the far reaches of the world. The book of Acts begins in Jerusalem, but it ends in Rome. And so you can see even through the narrative what we have in the book of itself, the development and the expansion of the church. It's a book that follows that that mission that God has given his people. And it's a mission that we're going to see very clearly that is a supernatural mission as God empowers and enables his, his disciples and his church to take the gospel forward as they seek to evangelize and make disciples and gather Christians into local churches and to see that continue on and on. We've entitled this series Unstoppable because that's exactly what we find. As the gospel goes forward, it's an, it's an unstoppable reality as the light goes out into the darkness. As we see the multiplication of believers and the multiplication of the church, we can look around today and literally all over the world we see The gospel has been made known, and we see believers following after Jesus. As we begin our journey today in Acts, we're going to be picking up right where Luke leaves off in his gospel. And Jesus is preparing to ascend back into heaven, and just before he does, he gives his disciples these words that were just read for you. Some clear directives regarding the mission that he was leaving them with, that they're to carry on. And so these first 11 verses establish for us these missional directives given to the disciples, by extension to the church as it continues on. And I want you to note four essential things that will shape and characterize and carry this mission forward that we find here in these 11 verses. Four essential things that shape this mission as Jesus gives it to his apostles. The first thing that we see is this about the mission. Number one, it's a mission that is built upon a central message. It's a mission that is built upon a central message. And you can see already the the reference here in the first verse back to the Gospel of Luke. He says in the first book, that's Luke, Luke, Gospel of Luke, Theophilus. He's writing to, to this man named Theophilus. And he says, I've dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. That's the Gospel of Luke. It started to describe all of that. Until the day he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. The book of Acts has historically, you can probably see it in your Bible, it says at the very top, the title, the Acts of what? The Apostles. The Acts of the Apostles. And certainly the Apostles, the disciples, are a central part of the narrative. But they're not the only part of the narrative. Others have come along and said, no, really, the book is about the Holy Spirit. It should be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit because it's the Holy Spirit that arrives in the book of Acts and carries forward this mission. And I would say it's true that the Holy Spirit is a central part to the book of Acts and a central figure there. But it's not only about the Holy Spirit. And so that would be... I wouldn't say inaccurate, but not necessarily telling the whole picture as well. I think it's best to see the book of Acts as a narrative that is centered upon the claims and the hope of the risen Christ. And as the disciples take that message out, empowered by the Holy Spirit, as we will see, you can begin to understand the centrality of the message of the risen Savior that takes root here. It's through the presence of the risen Christ that the apostles, empowered by the Holy Spirit, are able to engage in a mission that takes this good news, this message of hope, to the world. A message that is centered upon the person and work of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who came to the world, lived as a man, died on a cross for our sins, was raised from the dead three days later, and has now ascended back into heaven and has promised to come again. It is through him that we find forgiveness of our sins and we find hope, transformation, 
And that's exactly the message that these apostles were going to carry to the ends of the earth. We see this here, don't we? How the centrality of Jesus is the focus. Even in verse 1, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that who began to teach. All that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up. The, the clear implication there, as, as Luke reflects back upon what he began to do and what Jesus uh, began to teach in the gospel of Luke, the implication is that this second book is going to continue to describe what Jesus continues to do in and through the lives of his people. It's the words and deeds of Jesus that take center stage. It's the words and deeds of Jesus that were central to the gospel of Luke. It's the words and deeds of Jesus that will continue to be central to the book of Acts as the gospel and the good news about Jesus continues to be made known. Even here in verse 3, we already have reference to this resurrection, the fact that we are serving and that we know a a Savior who is alive and well. Jesus had presented himself alive by many proofs, we're told. In fact, over 40 days as he spoke about the kingdom of God. And we can can go back and and find that in the Gospels, can't we? As he presented himself, as the the women would come to the tomb and, and find it empty and then encounter him. And we know that he presented himself to the disciples in various settings Some 500 people on one occasion, according to 1 Corinthians 15. And so the point in all of that is simply to say that the resurrection of Jesus would change and shape everything that was about to unfold. These disciples were not being sent out on a mission where they were just kind of winging it, kind of trying to put together some, some message that would be you know, agreeable or something like that. No, they had encountered for themselves the the reality that their leader, that their Savior had been raised from the dead. And that would fuel all that they were about to do and all that they were about to say. So, So the resurrection is indeed that fuel that would send this gospel message out on its way to the ends of the earth. It's no accident already that within these first few verses of Acts, that we have reference to the death and resurrection of Christ, right? The centrality of the hope that is found in the lives of these disciples rests on that fact that Jesus lived, he died, he was raised from the dead, right? That's what he did in order to accomplish our redemption. And so if you're here today and you're hoping to be made right with God and you're just hoping that that can happen because of kind things you do, or you're just a nice enough person to somehow make your way into heaven, that's not the way to heaven. No, God so loved this world that he sends his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but to save the world. That whoever would believe in Jesus, embrace all that he is and all that he did, as he laid down his life for sinners, he took upon himself the full justice and wrath and anger and judgment that God has against our sin, he took upon himself on the cross so that we could be forgiven and made right with God. And if you would simply put your hope and trust in him, that is the message that these apostles would receive and that these apostles would take forward. The point, again, is simply to say that, that that is their central hope. We note here in verse 2, notice in verse 2, if you look there, it says, Uh, In the first book, I've dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. If you could just jump back to the Gospel of Luke for a moment. Just turn there in your Bibles into the Gospel of Luke. If you go to chapter 24, you see there in verse 44. Again, this is Jesus appearing to his disciples before he ascends to heaven. Very close to what we have here in Acts chapter 1. He says to them, in verse 44, Luke 24, 44, then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You, 
he says, are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. I think he picks up here in verse 2 about the commands that that the, the, the apostles had received from Jesus as a reference at least, if not the entirety of his ministry, but at least to what we have there in Luke chapter 24 as he commands them to make known this hope to the ends of the earth, that this message of repentance should go out. And that's exactly what he charged them to do. And that's what this book documents. The book of Acts documents that mission that they were to do, that they were to take and go and be part of to the ends of the earth. And it's a mission that we continue today. The mission of the church continues on to point the world to the hope that is found in Jesus Christ and in him alone. Therefore, our message must be one that is centered on the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Because it's his work that brings lasting hope to the world. So that's what we want to center our message on, the, the, the life death and resurrection of Christ. We, we don't want that message to get lost. We want to steward that message well. We want that message to be central. Just a few months ago, we even did a whole series on liturgy and talked about how our services are even structured to keep that gospel message central to who we are so that as we're being shaped, even in our worship, that that message continues on. So we see that this mission is a mission that is built upon a central message, and that is the the message about the person and work of Jesus Christ. You see that very clearly here in these first few verses. But number two, the second truth about, the second thing that we need to note about this mission is this. It's a mission enabled by a critical power. Verse four and five, look at what Jesus, or what the, uh, uh, what Luke writes, and then what Jesus says. He says, and while staying with them, He ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem. We saw that in the Gospel of Luke. He's like, stay right here in the city until you receive power from on high. He says, orders them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So here we begin to pick up on, and we've seen already, just this new emphasis on the, second per- the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. In fact, in the first 11 verses, the Holy Spirit is mentioned three times. Verse 2, verse 5, verse 8. So all of a sudden, it, it, it's no wonder that people say, well, it's really the acts of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit begins to take on a prominent role. And it's true, He does. The Holy Spirit is first mentioned in verse 2, as we saw. As Jesus was giving commands to his disciples, he was giving these commands through the Holy Spirit. Then here in verse 5, we see that Jesus has instructed them to remain in Jerusalem until they received the Holy Spirit, which would empower them for mission. You'll notice this empowerment, right? You'll notice this empowerment is described here as baptism. Contrasted even with the baptism that John did. Look at there. He says, he says, for John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. John baptized with water is a baptism that prepared the people for the coming of the Messiah, emphasizing the, the, the cleansing that he would bring. But the baptism by the Spirit was now a sign that the Messiah had come and a new era in, in some sense had begun. This baptism is not a literal act of water baptism, but simply a type of metaphor used to describe the cleansing and enabling power that the Holy Spirit would supply the people of God. It was that they were immersed in the Spirit, if you will. When you think about that, you see now that the scene is set. We've been given a clear mandate. We made that connection back to the end of the gospel of Luke where he gives them these instructions to go and to make this message known and to preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins to the ends of the earth. The Lord's going to direct this mission as we're going to continue to see in our text today. The apostles themselves, these disciples would be active participants in the mission and that they would now have the Holy Spirit to empower them for this mission. 
this final reality that would make the missionary witness of the apostles successful. There was no way this group of 12 men, as they were, could, could have the impact that they have by the end of the book of Acts without the Holy Spirit. We know that the mission God has given his people continues on today, and it's a mission that continues to require the enabling power of the Holy Spirit. Now, when we talk about the, the power of God's Spirit working in and through his people, we're talking about both God's visible and invisible activity to enable our participation in his mission for us to be effective. Now, listen, I am a big advocate of organization and structure and strategy. I love thinking through those things, and I can spend all day long thinking through strategy and structure and process and all of those types of things. Now, that's just how my mind is, is wired. I like that kind of organization and, and structure. But listen, we can organize and strategize all we want and still find our work ineffective if we are not leaning upon and following the lead of God's Spirit. We need the presence and the power and the provision of God's Spirit in our lives to give us wisdom and clarity and discernment and awareness and boldness and all of those things that we need that we can't just muster up on our own and and we can strategize with the best of them. But a strategy without the Spirit will fall well short every single time. The Holy Spirit is who we need as he accompanies the preaching of the gospel. Even when we tell people the gospel, we preach the gospel or share the gospel or talk to people about the gospel. Like if it's up to you to get them converted or saved, they're in big trouble. They need the illuminating power of the Spirit to open their blind eyes and to give them new hearts so that they can then understand the truth. They need the Spirit of God to convict them of sin, that they have been lawbreakers and broken the commands of God. They need the work of the Spirit. So we all do. It's the Holy Spirit that accompanies the preaching of the gospel. It's the Holy Spirit that opens blind eyes, that illuminates understanding. It's the Holy Spirit that gives believers boldness and clarity. It's the Spirit that will prompt you, when least expected, to have a conversation with someone you weren't planning to have. And it's the Spirit that brings fruit to bear. So then, fellow Christians, just simply ask you this question, how often... Are you deliberately looking to the Holy Spirit for his help? We can apply that across the board to anything in life. We're talking here about the mission that God had given his disciples and his church, but just step back for a moment and ask yourself that question just in life, period. Like, are you consciously looking to, leaning on, seeking after the provision and presence and power of God's Spirit in your life on the day-to-day? Or are you just trying to figure it out? Are you just trying to drink enough coffee? I drink a lot of coffee. But that, ain't, that, that doesn't cut it. You know, if, if, if we seek to, to engage life just in our own strength and our own power, we're going to fall way short. We're so inadequate. We need the presence and power and provision of God's Spirit And that's exactly what Jesus promised he would give. That's exactly what we're going to see throughout this book of Acts. It is the Spirit of God that comes upon the people of God so that the mission of God can be successful. That's the reason this mission is unstoppable, not because we're smart and we got good strategies. No, it's the Spirit of God that, that empowers us and makes the message successful and ultimately unstoppable. Number three, a third reality that we need to understand about this mission is this. It's a mission defined by a clear strategy. Now you're thinking, well, I thought you just said you're, we shouldn't do that. I want to show you that, they're, that both the spirit and strategy are not in, they're, they're, they can work together, right? They, you, you, it's not, I've got to either have one or the other. And I think that's where usually churches get in trouble, Christians get in trouble. They're either all strategy or all spirit. And you know what, you, you can see them. They're just, you know, The Holy Spirit gets blamed for a lot, and so they'll say, well, I'm just being spirit-led. 
And then you got the frozen chosen that's just about their strategy, right? No, we, we need both, and that's exactly what we see here in this text. I, I, I think strategy is still important. You see strategy in the book of Acts, and you see a bit of strategy here as Jesus, when he meets with his disciples just prior to his ascension back into heaven, he gives them some strategy. But before that, they're, they're seeking some clarification. The disciples are always, not always, they're often confused, all right? Um, all right, it's okay to be confused sometimes, but you're in good company. So look at verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, so they're hearing all this about the kingdom of God and the promise of God's spirit coming upon them. And so they asked, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So immediately they're thinking the consummation of the kingdom is here. They're thinking the end. They're thinking, well, we've arrived. And Jesus says to them, it's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I wonder if this is the time for the restoration of Israel, the time when the fullness of God's kingdom would come. And Jesus answers them somewhat indirectly by dismissing the focus on the timing of Israel's restoration. And he says, that's for the father to know. That's the father's business. Don't mind yourself with that. Here's what you need to be focused on. It's as if Jesus is saying, put your end times books and charts away. The Lord will resolve that. Here's what you need to be occupied with. You'll be my witnesses. The focus was to be on the mission at hand. You know, we do that often, don't we? You think about these disciples asking questions and trying to seek clarity here. And, you know, their hope and their focus is on on the, the fullness of God's kingdom. But we do the same thing. We get all caught up with all kinds of things, don't we? all kinds of speculation about this or that, and, and we get fascinated and enamored with, with end-time speculation, and we see that going on in the world and that going on in the world and this moon popping up and that, that happening here, and, and we're, is this the end? And Jesus would say, that's for the Father to know. Here's what you need to be busy with. You need to be busy with this. I, I, again, I think I see that oftentimes uh, with, with Christians getting preoccupied with good things, but not ultimate things. I appreciate what Patrick Schreiner said in one of his commentaries on Acts. He says, in Acts, Luke is more concerned about the question, to whom is the kingdom given, than when will the kingdom appear? And I think that is right. That ought to be our focus as well. Three things I want you to notice briefly about the scope or the strategy of this mission. Number one, the how of mission, the how how will this be accomplished? We've already covered that a bit. And at, just at, simply as a quick reminder, I want to point you to the how. He says, verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. That's the how. How are we going to do this? By the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. We need to keep that in view that God's mission is a supernatural mission that we need him empowering us to accomplish. You see that exemplified throughout the book of Acts, but let me just give you two quick snapshots of that reality. In chapter 4, verse 7, as, as Peter and John are there before the council, and you see just a quick reference to this here. It says in verse 7, And when they had set them in their midst, they inquired, By what power... Or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders. And he goes on. And so the point there is that as they're, you know, as, as Peter and John are accomplishing ministry, as they're speaking truth, as they're doing various things, and they get called in by leaders, their question examined, by what power are you doing this? And Peter's quick to acknowledge it's the power of God's Spirit. You see that also in, in Stephen, as we'll see later on in chapter 6. When he's arrested, verse 8 just simply says this, and Stephen, full of grace and power. Was that because he was flexing down at Gold's Gym all the time? No, it's the power of the Spirit, right? It's the presence of the Spirit. Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Not because he was bright and smart and capable in himself. No, it's because he was a man who was filled with the power of the Spirit. That's the how of mission. 
Notice also number two, the what of mission. Jesus says that very clearly. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. That's, that's what they're told to do, to be. You will be my witnesses. A witness, we know, is someone who testifies in legal matters. The apostles had a unique place in the life of the church, the, the, the mission that God had given them. The apostles had been eyewitnesses of Jesus' life, ministry, his death and resurrection, and soon to be his ascension. And Jesus seems to connect this language of witness to how the Lord describes Israel even in Isaiah 43 where he calls them witnesses. The apostles were now called to the same role, a role that they could fulfill uniquely because of their direct experience and their eyewitness experience with Jesus. It's a reminder to us that the Christian faith, this is an encouragement, it's a reminder to us that the Christian faith is not a faith that's founded on a hunch or speculation, or a dream, or some vision somebody had somewhere. No, the Christian faith is a faith built upon the objective fact and reality of Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and ascension, what these men saw with their own eyes. It was not a hunch. It was observed and recorded. And as such, these witnesses could give credible witness to the ministry and purpose of Christ. It would be this witness that would propel the good news forward and see the church established and expand throughout the world. Now, you think about our role and place today. Our mission, our responsibility today is both similar and different from what the apostles had. We aren't witnesses in the same way as they were. We, we, we weren't there. We didn't walk with Jesus We didn't observe his life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection firsthand. However, we continue to bear witness to the same truth and facts, a witness that's built upon their witness. It's a ministry, as Paul would say in Ephesians 2, verse 20, that's built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. We are leaning upon their eyewitness accounts to bear witness to Christ even today. The message of the apostles and the message of the church throughout history has remained the same. The message hasn't changed. It's the same message, just the same promise, it's the same hope. We are called to faithfully advance this good news to the world, to make disciples as Jesus commanded his his disciples to do, to go and make disciples of all nations. And we see how Acts underscores the value of seeing these disciples carry that message forward and seeing the church established and and continue to multiply throughout the world. One of the things you're going to see in the book of Acts is that the church, the local church, becomes both the means and the end of mission. It's through the church and its call to proclaim the gospel and to make disciples that we see what? Disciples made, gathered in local communities, established in local churches. You see all these letters now that start, getting, get, start to get uh, written to, to various churches and leaders throughout the New Testament. The church then becomes both the means and the end of mission. The church is given this sacred treasure of the good news about Jesus to declare it to the world, to make disciples, to, to gather in local churches disciples who embrace this message and seek to live out lives that are transformed by the provision of the gospel and the power of the Spirit. That's the what. There's a whole lot more to it than that, but that's an overview for now. They were to be witnesses to this. They were simply just to go and tell people what they saw about Jesus. What about the where? That's where we get a little strategy, right? Now, many of you, if if you've been in church very long, you're likely familiar with the language of verse 8. Acts 1-8 gets quoted a lot when we think about missions. The announcement of this good news, Jesus says, he says, you will be my witnesses. Where? In Jerusalem. That's where they are now. And in all Judea, a little bit larger area in that same region. Samaria, a little bit larger area, just a little bit further out. And 
to the end of the earth. What you're going to find even in the book of Acts is actually that the book itself is structured, is basically outlined in that way. These these instructions Jesus gives here, we're going to actually see that develop throughout the book of Acts. In fact, Acts chapter 1 verse it's, it's chapters 1 through 7 where we see the, these disciples and early church in Jerusalem. And then in chapters 8 through 12, how it expands to Judea and Samaria. And then from 13 on to the end of the book in chapter 28, how it reaches to the ends of the earth. And that's exactly where, how Acts tracks. It's not that they leave Jerusalem behind. You'll see references to all of these areas throughout the book. But it's, it's building upon that strategy Jesus gave his disciples. And it was always the plan. This wasn't just some new thing Jesus thought of and thought it would be a good idea to do. You go back to the Old Testament in Isaiah 49 verse 6, we see that this was God's plan when he says through the prophet, it is too light a thing, this is Isaiah 49 verse 6, it is too light a thing that you should be my witness, my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. The good news of how God saves sinners has always been news that was intended for the far reaches of the earth, for every people group on the planet. So the where is quite simple. Everywhere. (laughs) Everywhere. Began with these early disciples in Jerusalem and would spread to their larger region and later throughout the known world. That's what I said earlier. The book of Acts starts in Jerusalem and by the time you get to chapter 28, we're in Rome. It's kind of the ends of the earth for that day, the known world for that day. Christopher Columbus hadn't come along yet, or whoever these people were that would find new places. The where is quite simple. We're called to go and make disciples. The mission continues this very day as the church continues to make known the truth of the gospel to the far reaches of the world. And, you know, you think about the reality that we have today just on a global scale that much of the, many of the barriers that exist today are, are not so much geographical. We have airplanes now, right? We have the internet. We have access to the world like never before. And so while there are some geographical challenges, many of the challenges that we fight and face today are cultural and religious in nature. So the scope of our mission is still global, maybe with unique challenges that haven't existed before. And so the point of saying that is simply this, is that we should labor faithfully to see this good news reach our neighbors in the neighborhoods, our coworkers in the workplaces, and to the nations. Like there's no place on the planet that's off limits for this mission. And so you think about that, you're like, well, that's broad. It is. And obviously we can't be everywhere and do everything. So we have to be thoughtful. That's where we have to be somewhat selective and thoughtful about thinking through where's, where's our place individually, also corporately as a church, how we engage in this work in the world. You can easily overwhelm yourself by thinking you've got to do every single thing, and you don't. So let me encourage you. You don't have to do everything. God has a lot more people than you and us. And so we just have to figure out, okay, Lord, where would you have me? How would you, where would you, just think about the context that you've been placed in. You've been placed there, not someone else. It's you that have the coworkers you have. It's you that live in the neighborhoods that you live in. It's you that have your extended family, for better or for worse. It's you that have these connections and these relationships that you have that someone else does not have. And so that's where you begin. With those, you know, there's a book called Concentric Circles of Evangelism, and it helps you really think through this really well. You just begin in the context God has placed you in, and you just steward that faithfully. And then you serve where you can as, you, as the Lord would call you to, to, to do that in other contexts, in other places. Sometimes the Lord calls us out and sends us out full time to serve in places that we know need the gospel desperately. And so we can't obviously be everywhere. So we have to be selective and prayerful and thoughtful about where the Lord would have us and lean upon the Spirit for his guidance and help. It's one of the beauties about being connected to a collective of 45,000 churches in our convention and hundreds of other churches in the pillar network where we can have confident cooperation so that we can serve together 
leveraging each other's strengths and weaknesses to make sure that the gospel of Jesus Christ is going out to the ends of the earth. Then number four, the last observation I want you to see is this. It's a mission that's motivated by a compelling promise. It's a mission that's motivated by a compelling promise. After Jesus said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up. So this is where Jesus is ascending back into heaven. You just imagine they're just standing there, like, watching him go up. As they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand there looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Once Jesus finishes this exhortation, he's lifted up. He goes back into heaven to the right hand of the Father. And while they stood there watching, these two men, we're told, two angels come along and they're like, hey, why are you looking up there? He's coming again, as he said he was, would. He's going to come again, just like you saw him go. But in the meantime, the implication is there's work to do. Right? There's, there's, there's work to do. He will come back as he promised. And I just want, and I think we have that here because we see that there's a bit of motivation for mission here. They're reminded as they looked on by the words of these angels that, listen, he is coming back. He is returning. There is this eschatological motivation that exists in the lives of the disciples that, yes, one day Jesus will return, establish his kingdom in full. But in the meantime, we are called to steward the message, to steward the gospel, to make known the truth about the kingdom of God, to make known the the centrality of the gospel to a lost and dying world. We're called to be agents in that mission, to make it known and to take it wherever we go. But until that day, a day only the Father has appointed and a day only the Father knows, we have work to do. We have work to do. As we long for that day, as we anticipate that great and glorious day, as we think about it. Earlier I said you should put away your end times charts and, and, and all that stuff. Well, that's half true, but we, it's not that you shouldn't ever think about the end. We should. We should think about and long for and pray for and be excited about the fact that Jesus will come again one day. But in the meantime, we have work to do. We've been given mission directives on the heels of the apostles, as we will see, a mission that's built upon this central message, the centrality of the gospel of Jesus Christ, a mission that is enabled by this this power that we need, a power that comes from the person of the Holy Spirit of God. It's a mission that's carried out with this clear strategy, that we take the good news, beginning where we are, and seeing that we're taking this good news to the ends of the earth. And it's a mission that's motivated by this certain promise that Jesus will one day come again, and bring us to himself and establish his kingdom in full and he will reign over us forever and ever in a new heavens and a new earth where it will be glorious. The book of Acts is that bridge that connects us from the things that Jesus began to do and began to teach to the work that we have now to make known all that he has done and all that he has taught as we long for that great and final day when he comes again. Brothers and sisters, this mission is supernatural. It's an unstoppable mission. The devil cannot stop this mission. No one on the planet can stop this mission from being carried out. The question is, are we going to joyfully join in and embrace the calling that we've been given as Christ followers and as the local church to join in the work that's being done as we seek to advance the gospel? It's a work, it's a mission that is carried out every single day in our neighborhoods and workplaces and schools. It's a mission that we are part of every single day. It's not that we have to to rally around some big event or some big thing that we go and do. No, it's just being faithful stewards of the day and the context in which God has given you. Leverage that well to remember that we're all on mission together for the glory of God and the advance of the gospel. A mission that the Lord has given his people and a mission that is truly unstoppable and will bring God glory forever and ever. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this reminder this morning that we have in your word, these mission directives that you gave your people, these early apostles, these early followers, Lord, that had such an important role as eyewitnesses 
to the truth of who Jesus is and all that he had done, all that he had fulfilled and promised. Even in, even in anticipation for, for his return. Lord, it's helpful to, for, to, to us to, to think through these things, Lord, just to be reminded and encouraged in our role today. So, Lord, would you help us to be strengthened? Would you help us to be aware of all that we need? Lord, lives built upon this message of hope in the gospel, lives empowered by the Holy Spirit, lives that are lived out in faithful stewardship of the call that you've given us to be witnesses, and, Lord, lives that are motivated by this glorious hope of Christ's return. Father, would you help us to steward this calling well? Would you help us to be faithful servants of our sovereign King? And would you help us to do it with joy, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.